Good morning and welcome to worship at Community United Methodist Church in Fairfield, California. And Pastor Ann Choi, thank you for joining us this morning in worship. And thank you to Pastor Lois Eddy who led us in worship last Sunday. It was good to get away a little bit and it's always good to be back. We want to just bring your attention to a few announcements. For those of you who get the emails with the links to worship, there's actually a worship bulletin if you'd like to take a look at that. And there are some announcements and other information there. Uh, we want to just let people know that our Kids for Christ is starting back up today. Our Wednesday Bible study, our prayer meeting continues on Fridays, and we also, our choir is meeting by Zoom on Thursday night. So if you're interested in that, please talk to Jordan or someone on the choir. We still have social hour after this on Zoom. All are welcome and invited to just come and see a friendly face and have a, a little bit of a chat there after worship. This coming week is our annual conference session uh, will be by Zoom and it will be um, streamed on our conference website. Next Sunday, we are all invited to join the, the conference worship service at 1030. Uh, it will be the service of ordination. And if you've never been uh, to that, it really is quite a beautiful and, and inspiring opportunity to uh, be part of the ordination of our new, our new clergy. So please go to our annual conference link at cnumc.org and that will be happening from Friday this week to next Sunday. You're welcome to observe and join in with that as well. We still will have worship as well, and so we'll see you here this uh, next week also. You might have realized because of the bad air, we did not have our outside worship today or Saturday. So hopefully next week, but stay tuned. If you're interested in joining that, please continue to call the church office to register your intent to attend, and uh, we will keep you posted. But until then, we'll continue to be flexible and worship God wherever we are. This Wednesday, there is a new something happening, Virtual Vespers. Virtual Vespers, Wednesday night, 730 on our YouTube channel. Uh, 7.30 on Wednesdays, and it will be just a, a little music, some reflection and prayer. Uh, Jordan Provost, our music director, will be leading that first one, and so I hope you will tune in. Just a little something midweek to connect us to each other, to God, to worship together. Let us prepare our hearts as we gather in worship, and our first song is how great thou art. Let's sing with uh, gusto together.
Let's prepare our hearts for a word of prayer together. Uh, we want to just share that Kathy Williams still tested positive this past week for the virus. Uh, ended up in the hospital a week ago, just feeling really worn down. Uh, she is really improving and grateful for the care there, so please continue to pray for her and for others who are fighting the virus. We want to lift up Juanita Fleming and her family. Her brother Joseph passed away September 2nd in Chicago, and so uh, I believe she went to be with family for his service, and we will lift them up in prayer as well. Today, parts of the prayer are from Reverend Daniel London, an Episcopal priest up in Eureka, in the midst of all the fires that are going on. So let us, you know, there is a lot going on these days, isn't it? So let's just take a moment to take in a deep breath in. Breathe slowly out. Deep breath in, and as we breathe out, say, Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Deep breath in. Breathe out. Come, Lord Jesus. One last time. Deep breath in. Breathe out. Come, Lord Jesus. God of creation, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When we look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you establish, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, that you care for us? Lord, you have chosen us as your beloved, and yet we often live as if it were not so. We are tempted by things that are not good for us, and we pull and that pull us away from you. We believe we know better than you. We do not trust in your promises. Wipe away our foolishness. Bring us back into a trusting relationship with the one who has lovingly created us and longs to be our strength and our life. We ask your forgiveness for the wrongs we have done against you. Cleanse us by your Holy Spirit, and we gratefully receive your mercy and forgiveness offered through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Almighty God of wind and rain, of sun and stars, we live in a world where beauty and danger surround us. Receive our prayers for those who are impacted by and living in fear of wildfires across California and Oregon and Washington and Nevada. For all who have lost or may lose their homes, churches and workplaces for all who seek food and safety or shelter for your glorious creation that has been destroyed and for that which is in harm's way strengthen with your presence all who are numb and distressed guide those who anxiously search or wait for loved ones be near those who are grieving and carry them in your peace in the midst of disaster, we give thanks for moments of generosity and human kindness. Grant your tenderness, your strength, your wisdom to firefighters and emergency responders, to park rangers and those who care for the earth, to all who care for others in this time of distress. We pray for the full containment of fires and for the multiplying of people and supplies, that there would be more than enough resources for this job. For nothing is impossible for you, O oh God. We pray for the family of Juanita Fleming and the loss of her brother Joseph. We are humbled, Lord, in the face of death. And we praise you, Lord Jesus, that you have defeated death and go before us to prepare a place for all who love you. Receive this dear son and others into your arms and comfort all who grieve. Be with our dear sister Kathy and others who are recovering from the virus, for people facing physical and emotional challenges and those who serve them. Breathe your life into them 
and refresh them by your Holy Spirit. We ask your healing for all who are sick and in need, and we name these dear ones now before you in the quiet of our hearts. Lord Jesus, bless Community UMC. Bless the United Methodist Church and your church worldwide that we might be your hands and feet in the world. Guide us to continue doing the work of your church, to worship you, to serve, to build community, to pray even now. And for opportunities that are still revealed even in this time, for new friends, for new relationships, which you lead and guide us with hope. We pray, Lord, for our government leaders locally and nationally, for our mayors, our council members, for Gover Governor Newsom, for President Trump, for our world leaders. Guide and lead them all and guide and lead them each in this challenging and unprecedented time. Anoint and equip them with wisdom and humility and courage to serve your kingdom. Lord, we gather these prayers with the assurance as children of God, and we pray together now the prayer that our Savior Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture is Genesis 2, verses 4 through 7, 15 through 17, and Genesis 3, verses 8, 1 through 8. In the day that the Lord God had made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth and no herb of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and water the whole face of the ground and breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tilt it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat any tree from the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We might eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the, of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman, so when the woman saw, saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, he took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was also with her, and he ate. Then the eyes were both open, and they knew they knew they were naked, and they they, they sewed fig leaves together and made woolen cloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Good morning, all of God's children. Imagine that your mom has put two 
bowls on the table. Now one bowl is full of fresh fruit, bananas and oranges and grapes and apples. And in the other bowl, a big pile of chocolate candy. Hmm. Well, after setting the bowls on the table, your mom says to you, you can eat anything from the bowl of fruit. Those things are good for you and they make you strong and healthy. But from the bowl of chocolates, you must not eat anything at all. Candy's not good for you. It will surely make you fat and cause cavities. Well, I'm sure that you probably know that the surest way to get someone to do something is to tell them they can't do it. It's been that way since the beginning of time. In fact, that's what our Bible story is about today. In the beginning, after God had created everything, he placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden so that they could take care of it. He said to them, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, except you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will surely die. Well, along came a snake, a great big snake. And he was more clever than any of the animals that God had made. He slithered up to Eve one day and he said to her, I understand that God told you that you could eat from any tree in the garden. Is that true? Well, well, not all of the trees, Eve said. We can eat from all the trees except that one in the middle. God told us that if we eat from that tree, we will die. The snake said to Eve, you won't die. God knows that the very moment you eat from that tree, you will be just like God. You will know everything, even what is good and what is evil. Well, you know what Eve did, don't you? That's right. She ate some of the fruit from the tree that God had told them not to touch. She thought it was good, so she gave some to Adam, and he ate it too. At that very moment, their eyes were opened and they realized that they had disobeyed God and they were ashamed. And God banished them from the garden and they suffered for their disobedience for the rest of their lives. And that's the story of how Adam and Eve were tricked by a sneaky snake. You and I face temptation every day. Things that we want to do, we know we shouldn't do. We eat things we shouldn't eat. We do things that mom and dad tell us not to do. But you know what? God wants what is best for us. He will help us to resist that temptation if we read the Bible and do what it tells us to do. Will you pray with me and follow along with the words? Father God, help us to follow your teaching and do what your word tells us to do. We know that we will sometimes fail. So we ask you to forgive us and set us on the right path. And all of God's precious children said, Amen. Well, I also wanted to mention that we have a uh, communion offering for the month of September. Our special offering will go to the American Red Cross and we'll be asking to have it applied here locally. Uh, your donation will be will be concluded with that from the church. And also, uh, we are beginning, I know it seems kind of warm, but we are beginning our coat drive, which will happen this month, and those coats will be collected for the Solano Dream Center. 
We know that there are many people in need all around us, and so let us continue to give uh, generously as we can to support and care for those around us. Well, it was great to have Jamie and Nathan offer our scripture reading, and thank you to Miss Linda for our children's moment. We are beginning our new narrative lectionary year as we look at the big stories, some of the big stories of the Old Testament, and we will end up in Jesus' story through the Gospel of Luke later on this year. It's appropriate to begin at the beginning, right? The book of Genesis and creation, and friends, the Hebrew word for the day is one you already know, is Genesis, which is a Hebrew word meaning the beginning. You probably could have guessed that. Many of us are familiar with Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he did it by the power of his words. Let there be. Genesis 2 is known as the second creation story. If you compare the two, uh, the creation, the order of life being created happens differently. I want to suggest you might be thinking, why are there two stories? One story is not enough to fully convey what God is doing, God's relationship to his creation. Our human words are limited for all that God is doing. And in many ways, Genesis 2 is seen as an answer to the question of what happened between God and humans. Where did it go wrong? So in Genesis 2, we start with a God who's created the earth and the heavens. There are no plants. There is nothing else yet. And then God says, well, there's no one to care for plants. So let's make people. Let's make humans to care for plants, to farm, to till the ground. And it, as he creates humans, often that word is translated in Bibles as man or male. But the word Adam means person means human. So really, we should say, God created a human from the dust, collecting up that dirt that was there, the earth, and from God's breath of life, he created a human. So we see God as the creator of the universe from nothing and no one else to something and to someone's. God is the activator, the initiator, making all things. And now that he is a human, he makes a garden. Because there's a human to care for. And in ancient cultures, it was more common for, to have many different gods, doing many different things. But in Genesis, we see that we have one God who does all these things. It's a little bit of, my God is bigger than your God. Because my God created the sun and the moon and the stars. And we hear that our God, our God is pleased, is happy, filled with joy at creation. God is building a home, a world, to live with us as part of creation. From the very beginning, we are inherently made for connection with God and with others and with creation. There's a connection there from the very beginning. Well, God gives the human a job on God's behalf. He gives them instructions. I mean, after all, God is the owner, the creator. He gets to decide. And God makes animals from the ground, that same stuff that he made humans from. And the human names them all. But he says something, someone is still missing. So then we hear that God separates the human, the human into male and female. That Hebrew word for rib, right? Don't we usually hear that God took the rib from the male to form the female? That some would say the Hebrew word is more of a side. The side of the male Side of a human was taken out, and then a male and a female were formed. God forms. God forms like a potter forms pots. Getting his hands dirty, he's invested in it. You've seen potters, they're shaping, reshaping, adjusting. 
Many of you who do woodwork or construction or you're out of the garden sewing, crafting, cooking, you know how it is. You're working, you're adjusting, you're forming, you're figuring it out as it goes. Not from a distance, not instructing someone over there, but you're in it yourself. There's that personal involvement and connection. That is who our God is with humans and with all of creation. Then we hear that humans live with God and each other with complete joy. There is no shame. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Not just naked bodies, but I think it includes feelings, thoughts, everything that they do. There is nothing to hide or cover up from one another. There is no need for that. We are fully and completely loved by God. We are fully and completely with each other. There's just this delight for each other. That is God's intent for the world. God and creation and God's people in relation to one another. Well, this chapter 2, you know, is often, and then chapter 3 is often called the story of original sin. And that word sin is an archery term when we miss the mark with a bow and arrow. We miss the target. So sin against God is aiming at connecting more deeply with something, someone else besides God, besides the Creator, besides the life that was breathed into the world and into us. And when we do that, we worship someone or something else as if they are gods. As if they are greater than our Creator. You know, even good things can become sin when we make them ultimate things in our life. Work, family, money, health, wisdom. When we build our lives on them as the ultimate thing that gives us life, they become idols. They become gods with a small g. So when we sin, we lose sight of who the Creator truly is. Well, in chapter 3, we hear that the snake, the snake asks a simple question. You know, talk and words can change the meaning of simple words, can they? Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? Or did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? Raising doubts, getting them to eat the fruit, to do what God had told them not to. And the woman, actually, her answer is not quite right. She says, oh yeah, we can't eat it or touch it, or we will die. The snake is described as crafty, as clever, as saying, well, you're not going to die. God knows that you will then be like God. And do you notice that they're both kind of partly true and partly not story. It gets a little twisted along the way. And isn't that true of us too often? How we read, how we don't read scripture, how easy it is to confuse just a little bit what is essential in following Jesus. Perhaps this name implies, perhaps he claims that God is keeping something good from them. That God is a spoil sport. That he is restrictive instead of wanting good for them. And in some ways, what he says perhaps sounds reasonable. It makes sense. Now, any adult knows that those things are not mutually exclusive. Not all things lead to good. That we need to set boundaries from things that can lead us in bad ways. That temptations lead us away from God and others in ways that we cannot begin to foresee. Sin is really fundamentally about temptation. It keeps us focused on what we're missing, what we're lacking, what we want, instead of all that God has given. It's kind of that FOMO, fear of missing out. The grass is greener. There is something more and better 
over there that I need. There was such a long list of the wonders of creation that were given to the human and the one tree that they were warned not to eat from. I even think you could probably, they could have looked at it, touched it, used the wood or the branches, sat under it, but don't eat it. Don't eat the fruit. And then God said, when you eat of it, you will die. Well, did you ever wonder, what does that mean? And the tree of good and evil and the snake, why are they there if it's paradise? Is this a test? Was God going to do something else later with them? Something that we will not know now. I think these are just some of the many questions perhaps we can ask the Lord when we meet him. But temptation is often focused on the things that we can't or shouldn't do instead of enjoying the many other things that we can that lead to life. I think an easy example is most of us, our favorite foods are, are not good for us. They are fatty and greasy and they don't do good things for our bodies and we want to eat them as much as possible instead of what is good for our health, instead of eating it in a right proportion. Or I have to say for me, when I get bug bites, boy, is it hard not to scratch. I just want to scratch those bites. And that brief moment of going, oh, as I scratch, leads to longer discomfort of not getting better. I know these days it seems like the things that we are not good to do is so long. It's so long, isn't it? But in that, I remember Psalm 23. And it says to us, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not want. As we look at today's scripture story, you know, I want to just keep us mindful. I'm not trying to stifle any questions or doubts about God, because God can handle all those things. We, we need to bring our questions. We need to bring all of that to God. I believe he wants serious conversation partners and is inviting us deeper. But I noticed that Eve and Adam, who right, sounds like he's right there, both acted on what the serpent said more than what God told them. Nobody says, hey, wait, let's check with God on what he said. Let's ask him what he wants us to do. Just, let's just check. And I know, and perhaps you know, that when kids want to do something that parents don't want them to, they can still be doing it without telling, without, with being secretive or hiding. And even as adults, you know, we can do what we want because we're adults. But are there things that we do hide from others, from ourselves, and from God? Those actions begin a slippery slope of sin, doing what we want, what we think is best, making other things more important than our life with God. And we see they do not physically die, Adam and Eve, so what died? What was lost? Adam and Eve's disobedience led to the consequences of a broken relationship with God, with each other, and with creation. They now know they are naked in a way that is not good. They didn't know that before. They didn't notice that they start covering themselves up from each other. They start hiding from God. They have completely lost the ability to enjoy God's delight and presence and that full connection, walking in the garden together. Now they are naked and ashamed. God wants to see them. God is walking in the garden and calls to them, and they're hiding. And he's saying, what happened? Because this barrier has suddenly appeared between them and God. Maybe you have had relationships like that, 
too, where all of a sudden you don't even know what happened, but a wall drops down. Or you have felt that with others. Something changes. What that human intimacy with God, that relationship to each other, that connection with creation, all of that is now broken and changed. It goes on to say that the woman's relationship with the man, where they're blaming each other, they're hiding, that childbirth will be painful, that man's work and care for creation, that's going to be hard now. And that humans hiding from God, sent out of the garden, sent at a distance away from where God is. Things that were joyful and completely free before each other are now mixed. They're now broken. They're now fearful. They are tempted away from what they thought was good, what they thought they needed or even wanted. And they, they are now led away from God and hiding. You know, I have to say, sometimes I think, why did they do that? They messed everything up. But really, friends, if it was not them, others would have done it. Others came after them who likewise would have sinned in some way. Cain and Abel, those murderous brothers in Noah's time, people became wicked, focused on evil. The Bible is full of messy folks because we are all human and they are tempted away from God to hide. Friends, frankly, we fit right in. Imperfect people following a perfect God. Now, the good news for, for us and for all of humanity is that God still loved Adam and Eve, cared for them, and continues to guide them. He clothes them he gives them clothes before he sends them out. And we hear in scripture that he continues to reach out to people to be in a relationship. We will hear that as we move through the Old Testament. And God makes a way back to a full, joy-filled, right relationship with God through Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. That is still, that is now available to us. And we know that in part now, and we will know that fully. Can you think of someone who loves you so much that you just suck it up being with them? You just enjoy being with them so much that you're just so happy to see each other. And then you get this warm, good feeling. You feel safe. Even if the, your mistake is, it's okay, it's all good. It's all good. You're going to work it out together. And when life is tense and hurtful, when you are by that person, when you are with them, isn't it so much easier to recover? To feel like we're going to get through this. It's going to be all right. Friends, we can have this joy with our God, the creator of the universe. We can have that anywhere and everywhere, right now, even in this, especially in this time. And that feeling of goodness and peace Hope. We can bring that to all our other relationships. The sooner we recognize and admit that we need help, as soon as we ask for help for the temptations in our life, we can receive God's grace and draw closer to know our God who loves us. Return to God. Our God is always turning to you. Friends, we know this from our Methodist study of God's grace for us this summer. You know, we have a grandson who, he's still in that age of, you know, he's hiding and he covers his eyes because he thinks we can't see him then. It's cute at a two-year-old age. But as adults, friends, we don't need to hide. We don't need to hide and pretend that God can't see us. God sees us and is calling to us. Let me help you. Let me care for you. Return to God. Our God is always turning to you. So these days, friends, what temptations are you facing? I, I think most of us, we don't really, uh, maybe normally we might want the new or other thing, but these days, right, we just want what it was before. We just want it to go back to 
the previous normal. And there is so much going on. I think in some ways we are a bit tempted to focus on what is fearful, what makes us angry, self-righteous, overwhelmed, grieving. We're finding our safety and security. We find life in politics or entertainment or food instead of God. And remember, even good and helpful things can become sin when we make them ultimate things. Remember, from the beginning, we are made for a connection to God, connection to others, and connection to creation. Friends, it is like God and God's people to be connected, to not hide. And God sees us and hears us and understands and is glad to be with us and help us. That's who our God is, friends. So take time, take time to give thanks for all the abundance that God has given you. Perhaps to acknowledge your losses, to wait on Him. Friends, return to God. Our God is always ready to receive us. Let's take a moment to pray. And as you breathe out whatever ugh, fear, hurt, anger, Temptations breathe in God's life. Okay, so let's breathe out. Or let's breathe in. Breathe in. Breathe out the bad stuff, things that distract you away from God. Breathe in again. Breathe in God's life. Breathe out fears, worries. Breathe in again. Imagine God breathing into you. Breathe out. God of all creation, we are humbled and grateful for the wonder of your care for us. That you delight in us and want to be with us so much that you sent your son Jesus to show us your grace and your truth. To show us the way to you. We are in a time when it feels we have lost so much people and communities doing things we enjoy. A sense of safety and enjoyment of our country and the world. There are so many things we miss far more than we ever realized we would. Lord, we are tempted to find our hope and peace and comfort in so many things except you. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to recognize and turn to you. Thank you that you love us so much and made us for connection with you, with each other, with your world. Pour into us by your Holy Spirit a desire for more of you, to bring our serious conversations to you and to not hide. Open that connection Fill it up, Lord. Grow and renew it. Let it be part of who we are together as we give witness to who you are, O oh God. In the saving name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.
And now, brothers and sisters in Christ, I send you out to turn to our God, who is ready and willing, desiring to be with you, to turn away from your temptations, to turn to our God, who is more than able, by the grace of God, the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit be with you and in you, now and always. Amen.